Good afternoon and welcome to our session on the Dragonfly mission. If you have questions for our speaker during the session, please enter them into the chat feature below. Dr. Elizabeth Turtle is a planetary scientist at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and she is the principal investigator for the Dragonfly New Frontiers mission to Titan and the Europa Imaging System cameras on the Europa Clipper mission. Dr. Turtle has participated also on the Galileo, Cassini, and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter missions, and we are pleased to welcome her to ascend. Let me take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, very happy to be speaking to everyone virtually here today about the Dragonfly mission, which like uh, all missions is the um, result of work by a very large team of people, a subset of which uh, are shown in our team meeting picture here um, at the, the lower right, uh, back in a time when we were all allowed to stand a lot closer together than we are used to now in this era of social distan distancing. So Titan um, is a destination that offers a very unique uh, and compelling scientific opportunity. And this is because we don't really know how life came to form on Earth. And it's difficult to study that here on Earth because it's all overprinted. This prebiotic chemistry uh, is overprinted by biology on Earth. So we look to places elsewhere in our solar system to help answer some of these questions. And in many ways, Titan is most like the early Earth. And so that's why it holds such um, important keys to understanding the chemical origins of life. Titan is the largest of Saturn's 62 moons. Uh, it's shown here uh, to scale with the other satellites in the Saturnian system and Saturn itself. And it jumps out right away uh, because you don't see the surface of Titan when you look at it at visible wavelengths. And that's because Titan has an atmosphere. And it's the only moon in the solar system that has this kind of dense atmosphere. So here again is Titan with the other, with its cousins in the solar system, Ganymede, Callisto um, and the other, the other moons. Um, and again, it really stands out because it has this, uh, this atmosphere. And even among planets, this is unusual. In fact, Titan's atmosphere is denser than Earth's. So it's actually got the second densest atmosphere in the uh, solar system after Venus. Titan's actually the second largest moon in the solar system. It's a little smaller than Ganymede. Its surface gravity is about one seventh the gravity here at the surface of Earth. And the atmospheric pressure at the surface of Titan is one and a half times the atmospheric pressure here uh, at the surface of Earth. However, the surface temperature at Titan uh, is 94 Kelvin. Uh, so at these these temperatures, the bedrock composition is water ice, and the atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, and the second most common constituent of the atmosphere is methane. And this methane it causes, or is the, the reason for this very uh, rich organic environment on Titan. Photochemistry at the top of Titan's atmosphere breaks down the methane, produces very complex carbon molecules, uh, and these form um, large, these form large molecules that gather together to form aerosols, and this material falls out to the surface of Titan and covers the surface, where it's had the opportunity in Titan's past to have interacted with liquid water, potentially for extended periods of time. And beneath Titan's surface, deep beneath the icy surface, there's actually also a liquid water ocean. Titan, like many of the moons in the outer solar system, is, is an ocean world. So this is a map of the surface of Titan by the Cassini spacecraft. This is um, at multiple wavelengths in the near infrared. And it looks very different from a lot of the moons we see in the solar system. However, it's actually a surprisingly familiar place. And it turns out that these uh, equatorial regions that are shown in brown here are fields of organic dunes. So the sand on Titan is actually organic in composition. It's about the same size as sand here on Earth, uh, but it's organic in composition. And it forms these dunes that almost entirely circle the equatorial region of Titan. Titan also has impact craters, but again, like Earth, there are not very many impact craters. And that's because there's a lot of processing in the atmosphere and on the surface that erases the atmosphere, that erases the 
yeah, impact craters. There are a lot of um, geology, there's a lot of uh, surface modification that results in the impact craters being erased, similar to Earth. So there, there are only a couple dozen of, of confirmed impact craters on Earth. I mean, on Titan. Titan also has tectonic structures. There are mountain ranges. Uh, this being an icy satellite, the mountain ranges aren't terribly high. They're about a kilometer in, in altitude or so. Um, and they, uh, there are either isolated features or features that uh, form in, in uh, groups um, uh, across the surface. And here again, you can see where the, the uh, organic sand dunes kind of wrap around these, uh, these higher, uh, rougher mountain chains. And there's also the possibility of cryovolcanism, of cold volcanism, where the lava would actually be liquid water. The, uh, the, one of the best examples uh, here shown in a combined uh, Cassini radar and uh, near-infrared data set uh, is Sotra Patera, which is a very deep crater associated with a pretty high mountain uh, called Dune Mons here. And so the, the combination of this juxtaposition as well as flow-like features emanating from this area suggests the possibility of uh, a cryovolcanic history uh, at Titan. And then Titan also has a methane cycle, very much like Earth's water cycle, except with methane. So uh, there are clouds of methane and rain of methane, and then this has eroded the surface. There are channels. We see this in this image from the Huygens probe, which descended uh, here uh, to Titan's surface in January of 2005. And then at the poles, there are actually lakes and even seas of liquid methane and ethane. So in many ways, Titan's landscape is very familiar uh, to, uh, to people from Earth, uh, where we have this wide variety of geologic processes and interactions between the atmosphere and the surface. And we know that Titan has the key ingredients that are necessary for life, at least life as we know it, in the form of energy, uh, or energy in the form of sunlight that drives this, this photochemistry at the top of Titan's atmosphere, the organic material that results from that photochemistry falls out onto the surface where it's had the opportunity to mix with liquid water at the sites of both potential cryovolcanism uh, and impact cratering. And then there's also uh, a second liquid in the system uh, because of this active methane cycle on Titan. And liquid methane could potentially support the development of alternate biological systems. So on Titan, we have the opportunity to study prebiotic chemistry where organic material and liquid water have mixed in the past in the context of a complex planetary environment uh, as well as Earth-like surface processes. And so, uh, so this allows us to take the next steps from the exploration of Cassini and Huygens to answer fundamental questions about what makes a planet or a moon habitable, the chemical processes that led to the development of life here on Earth, and even has life developed elsewhere in our solar system. Now, we don't expect that at 94 Kelvin, the surface of Titan is a place that's conducive to life as we know it. But if chemistry took the step to biology at some point in Titan's past, we would be remiss if we don't uh, look for the answers to that question. And a lander with aerial mobility is key to being able to perform wide ranging exploration. We know from Cassini where we want to look for answers to these fundamental questions. There are diverse materials and environments with a variety of geologic processes modifying them. And the science challenge is to get instruments to multiple sites, the same way we've done on Mars with rovers. However, on Titan, heavier than air mobility is highly efficient. This is because the atmospheric density is four times higher than Earth's density and because the gravity is, is so low. So physically, it's actually easier to fly on Titan than it is here on Earth. 
And that's why Dragonfly is a, a rotor craft, or technically a, an X-8 octocopter. So the mission has a, a suite of elements. There's a cruise stage that takes us from Earth to Titan. And then there's the entry vehicle here, and you can see the cutaway view of Dragonfly, uh, the Dragonfly lander within the entry vehicle. And uh, here on the right is the, the rotorcraft lander itself. Dragonfly is designed to use an MMRTG, and we use this to charge the battery uh, based from which we power flight and science activities. Uh, the MMRTG also has a lot of waste heat, but for Dragonfly, that's not actually waste heat. That's a valuable aspect of our thermal design. Uh, because we can use the heat that comes off the MMRTG to keep the interior of the lander warm so that the instruments are in a nominal thermal environment. We also do direct to earth communication from the surface of Titan. We have a high gain antenna, which is shown here in its deployed uh, configuration. The, uh, because we have to worry about something that we're not used to worrying about for space flight very often, uh, namely aerodynamics, we actually stow the high gain antenna for flight uh, to reduce atmospheric drag. We also take advantage of the fact that the high gain, is high gain antenna is articulated uh, to be able to pan cameras around to take images uh, of the terrain around the, uh, around the lander. And so you see here at the top uh, these two uh, cameras um, on the high gain antenna. And we've designed Dragonfly to be able to make measurements on the surface, of course, uh, but also to do some atmospheric measurements uh, and aerial imagery in flight. Um, because we're all used to seeing uh, small drones, um, I wanted to make the point of the scale of Dragonfly. This is a Mars rover-sized lander or, or rotorcraft, uh, and this is just me to scale here with uh, one of the, the prototype rotors from our, our Phase A work. Um, so we're, we're used to thinking of, of drones as fairly, uh, fairly small and compact, but this is uh, the size of a, a Mars rover and the fact that we can fly from place to place on Titan is really a testament to the uh, environment that Titan provides for us and how conducive that is to atmospheric flight. The timeline for Dragonfly is a scheduled launch in 2026 with Titan arrival in 2034. This is uh, actually basically one Titan year after the Huygens probe arrived and uh, descended through Titan's atmosphere to Titan's uh, surface, also at low latitude. So we actually have atmospheric truth um, from this time frame in uh, Titan's uh, seasons. We also do direct atmospheric entry. Uh, and this is a very different atmospheric entry than we're used to, for example, at Mars, because Titan's atmosphere is very extended. So uh, the uh, entry interface is up at uh, over 1,200 kilometers altitude, and it takes about two hours to get all the way down uh, to the surface. So we've selected a landing site that provides us access to these organic sentiment, uh, sediments on Titan, as well as materials with a water ice component. And so the initial landing ellipse is within Titan's equatorial dune fields. And these are great landing sites because uh, not only are there very wide flat areas as shown in the Namib desert, uh, these images from the Namib desert, which is a very good analog for the types of dunes we have on Titan, but also there are different types of materials accessible very close in very close proximity because the dunes and the interdunes actually have different uh, types of materials on Titan the same way they, they do on Earth. And then we've chosen a landing site that is near to the Selk impact crater, which is about 80 kilometers in diameter, to allow us to traverse over the three years of exploration on Titan, which is about 74 Titan days, each Titan day being 16 days long. Um, and this allows us to traverse through the dunes and interdunes and then up into the impact crater deposits so that we can study materials with a very different geologic history, materials that uh, where the organics and liquid water may have had the opportunity to mix uh, for extended periods of time on Titan's surface. So in doing so, depending on where we land in the landing ellipse, we'll be able to uh, traverse uh, up to 180 kilometers or so, uh, exploring a couple of dozen unique sites on the surface. 
One of the things that uh, <clears throat> flight enables us to do is actually scout future landing sites before we uh, commit to them. So we actually have a, <clears throat> a exploration strategy where when we take off from one landing site, going to our next landing site, we actually fly, would fly past that and scout a future potential landing site before coming back to the previously scouted landing site. Uh, so this enables us to evaluate uh, hazards and safety of the potential landing site, as well as the scientific interest of the landing site. We actually, uh, Titan, as I mentioned, the, the Titan days, the, the TSOLs are about 16 Earth days long. Our nominal flight schedule is once per two Titan days. So that's actually about one flight per Earth month. Uh, so most of our time is really spent on the surface making science measurements and uh, communicating with Earth. The science we want to do uh, at each of the landing sites is multidisciplinary. The primary focus is on understanding the prebiotic chemistry on Titan, the components that are available and the processes that are at work that may produce biologically relevant compounds. To really understand this well, we need the context of the habitability of Titan's environment, to understand atmospheric conditions, to understand the processes modifying the surface and transporting materials across the surface, as well as uh, processes that may be able to mix materials from the surface with the interior water ocean, uh, or bring liquid water from the ocean up to the surface. And then of course, we also want to be able to search for biosignatures if there are, if there is chemical evidence that uh, the chemistry did take that step two biology on Titan. We don't know, uh, but we uh, have the capability to detect some chemical biosignatures as well. We have a instrument suite with four instruments. There's a mass spectrometer called the Dragonfly Mass Spectrometer or DRAMS provided by uh, NASA Goddard, which is based on the uh, SAM instrument on MSL uh, and MoMA development. This uh, the DRAMS here is shown in, in orange um, in this kind of ghosted view of Dragonfly. And then in red is the Draco system. This is the drill system uh, that uh, will sample materials on the surface and transport them pneumatically. Again, we can use Titan's atmosphere to our advantage to bring material uh, at almost ambient temperature from the surface into the, the mass spectrometer. We also have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. This again is, uh, this is based on uh, instruments um, on uh, other, other missions like uh, Messenger. Um, and we um, are partnered with uh, NASA Goddard on this because for Titan, because we have this great atmosphere, we actually need to bring our own uh, neutron source for the gamma ray neutron spectrometer. So we have a pulsed neutron generator. Dragons is shown here in purple in this cutaway view. We also have a suite of meteorology and geophysics sensors, and those are shown, you can see how distributed they are around the lander, uh, shown here in yellow. And then we have a suite of cameras as well, built by Mail and Space Science System, and you can see those in blue. So we have uh, forward-looking cameras and downward-looking cameras, as well as microscopic imagers that will image the, land, the uh, sampling sites. And then, as I mentioned, the panorama cameras here on the high-gain antenna. So I'll step through each of the uh, instruments um, and talk a little bit about what each of them uh, bring to the science measurements we'll be able to make. So Dragonfly will really, really be able to perform a comprehensive study of the chemical complexity of Titan's solid materials, uh, as well as the diversity from, from location to location on Titan. And this is showing uh, the, the different um, modes we have with the mass spectrometer and comparing the DRAMS uh, capability to SAM and MoMA capability. We also have the ability to look at the structures of the molecules we detect to look for uh, chiral preferences, which would be indicative perhaps of biotic compared to abiotic uh, processing of the materials. So we have two different sample analysis modes, the laser desorption mass spectrometry and gas chromatography mass spectrometry, and this allows us to get at different aspects of the materials on the surface. We also uh, have the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, and this allows us to get 
a complementary measurement of the bulk elemental composition of the materials beneath the lander. So the sampling, of course, is of very specific sites uh, at beneath the lander, between, beneath uh, the skids, where we have these two um, uh, redundant drills, one on either side. And then we'll get a broader view of the elemental composition from the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And this will allow us to classify the surface material and inform the types of sampling and measurements we want to do at each site. This also can actually reveal some of the near surface stratigraphy. For example, if there is organic material, a thin layer of organic material uh, over water ice. And so this will give us a, a, a sense of how available water ice is in the, the Titan system and how uh, the materials vary from place to place on Titan. We have the meteorological and seismological monitoring. This uh, is, these instruments are designed to monitor uh, standard atmospheric conditions, uh, the temperature, pressure, methane humidity, wind speed and direction to look for diurnal and spatial variations. We can also do atmospheric profiling to look at the lower atmosphere and the variation of uh, parameters with altitude. And then the, um, the geophysical instruments allow us to constrain aspects of the regolith. Uh, for example, the porosity uh, based on thermal diffusivity measurements, we can measure the dielectric constant in situ. And we also have the capability to make measurements that will help constrain processes that would mix materials through the, the ice shell. Uh, by sensing the seismic activity, the level of seismic activity on Titan, as well as measurements of the, elec the electric field that can give us a uh, estimate of the Schumann resonance. So there's been a lot of work done uh, recently on uh, planetary seismology, of course, with insight and with uh, work that's been done in preparation for in consideration of a, a Europa lander, uh, where again, we have an ocean world um, and you get very unique seismic environments where you have a solid shell over a liquid, a liquid ocean in the interior. And so there's some simulation shown here in terms of the types of, uh, in the types of waves that, and the arrival time for the, the seismic environment at Titan, uh, shown here with two different potential ice crust thicknesses. Really with Dragonfly, what we want to do is detect and characterize the level of seismic activity. And then depending on that level, we may be able to characterize aspects of the structure of, uh, of the, the surface of the, the um, water ice crust. And then the cameras uh, kind of provide the context from the area, the panoramas of the terrain surrounding the lander. Uh, to our forward and downward cameras, which can also be used in flight, and the microscopic imagers, which image uh, directly the sites of sampling. And we can actually uh, bring our own illumination in the form of LEDs, and this allows us to really distinguish different materials on the surface of, of Titan. In, and by doing imaging at night, uh, with UV illumination, we can actually look for fluorescence, which is quite common from different types of organic materials. And so that will be, uh, that will be a very interesting data set as well. So Titan's environment um, actually has a, a lot of in, uh, advantages for dragonfly exploration. There's a very dense atmosphere, which of course enables the aerial mobility. Uh, and gives us more time to phase all of the different steps during the entry, descent, and landing phase. And it, of course, enables pneumatic sampling and, and provides protection from radiation. The long Titan day uh, provides a, a, a fairly relaxed operation schedule. We can actually scale operations uh, to um, normal business hours here on Earth. No one has to live on Titan time. And um, the dense atmosphere and this very long day at Titan actually mean that the atmosphere is quite calm. The diurnal, seasonal, seasonal and spatial temperature variations are really only on about the order of a Kelvin. Uh, and this has been characterized quite well by Cassini. Um, and as I mentioned, Dragonfly would actually arrive about one Saturn year after the, the Huygens descent. So we have a, a good understanding of the, the atmosphere that we will be flying in. And the low temperature uh, 
also actually gives us the opportunity to take advantage of passive cooling for elements of the, the instruments or lander that need to be kept at low temperature. Uh, so we don't need active cooling. Uh, we can simply put the, uh, um, the Dragon's detectors that need to be at, at low temperature outside uh, in, the, uh, in the Titan environment to be at cryogenic temperatures. And there are a lot of uh, ways that uh, we hope to be able to share the adventure um, broadly with, uh, uh, with every, everyone. Um, there's a broad range of disciplines. It's a very interdisciplinary uh, mission in terms of the science that we'll be able to do, uh, but also in terms of our exploration strategy. Uh, we have the um, not only spaceflight, but also aeronautics. Um, and we have uh, also a lot of new technologies that we can take advantage of, like augmented reality and virtual reality simulations to be able to uh, share directly uh, exploration of Titan and exploration of Dragonfly. And this is uh, actually showing uh, someone to, a, this is about a half scale model of, of Dragonfly. This is an augmented reality tool that we can use for design of the lander, but is also um, a great way for people to actually be able to explore directly. Um, and then we have uh, opportunities for engagement planned throughout the mission cycle, uh, including NASA's planned participating scientist program and a complimentary uh, student guest investigator program. And uh, of course, uh, community presentations and, and, and workshops and meetings. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to uh, sharing the uh, excitement of exploring Titan. And I will, um, I will leave it there with this, uh, this video of um, exploring the Dragonfly rotorcraft. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience and I'll pass those along to you. So first, a congratulations. Uh, looks like from JPL, what an exciting and ambitious mission and congrats on selection. Um, how much of the Dragonfly concept is very specific to Titan uh, versus portable to other destinations in the solar system? Uh, right, so um, Titan is is really um, one of a few places that has a you know an atmosphere that's really conducive to uh, heavier than air flight. Um, but of course, there is the um, the Mars Scout helicopter uh, that just launched uh, with Perseverance to to Mars. So uh, Ingenuity has a lot of uh, commonality in terms of the the type of um, the you know in terms of the the type of exploration. Uh, that we hope to be able to do, but the, the Mars atmosphere is rather challenging. So the specific flight uh, that we're able to do with, with uh, Dragonfly on Titan is, is uh, enabled by the, the Titan environment, which is pretty, uh, pretty unique um, in that sense. But the, the, um, the strategies uh, you know, and the um, lessons that we can share uh, from Ingenuity, for example, all of those kinds of uh, aspects of mission development and, and planning uh, have some commonalities across destinations. I imagine there's some issues with the cryogenic temperatures. Is, can you say a little bit about that? Right. So yes, it's a it's a very cold environment. Um, the MMRTG. Uh, the excess heat from the MMRTG is really enabling in that sense, in that it allows us to uh, to keep everything warm within the within the lander, and so that that thermal balance is critical. And in the long run, that is what uh, that becomes the life limiting factor for Dragonfly, as the um, you know as as you get further and further out in terms of the the half life of plutonium. Uh, the power that comes from the MMRTG decreases, but also the heat that comes out of the MMRTG decreases, and eventually uh, Dragonfly will not be able to keep itself warm. But that is pa uh, well past the nominal mission uh, planned lifetime. As a follow-on, uh, what would be the most exciting science result that you can imagine, assuming the most optimistic outcomes? <laughs> Apart from, um, you know, little green men. <laughs> 
Um, there's so much uh, we have to learn about Titan. Really, you know, Cassini and Huygens just gave us this tantalizing view of, of a fascinating environment. Um, and so there, you know, the number of things that, that we will discover um, usually, well, is, is large. And usually the most, you know, the most exciting results are things you didn't even anticipate um, in the, you know, in the, the mission planning. So it's, it's hard to say what, you know, what would be the most exciting result because I, I think uh, Titan um, is, is probably more imaginative uh, as, as many destinations in the solar system have shown. Um, you know, the solar system has more imagination sometimes than, than we do. Uh, but being one of the things that I'm um, really excited about is being able to put the detailed chemical measurements into the context of the Titan environment and really understanding how everything fits together in, you know, at Titan as a system uh, and how, you know, how the atmosphere and the surface interact uh, and materials are, are moved. And I, the, the fact that we can bring all of that together uh, and understand the atmosphere aspects of the surface and even aspects of the interior is, uh, is really exciting to me. So when I was an aspiring grad student uh, in the NASA Space Academy, we had a large group of students uh, at the NASA Glenn Research Center, and we put together a NIAC-like report on a vehicle we called Titan IC or the Titanic. And it was designed to specifically explore the, the uh, lakes and the liquid bodies around Titanic. Um, the qu next question is, are there any plans for direct observation or measurements of those liquid bodies for this mission? Right, so the most of the liquid bodies on Titan are at the poles. Uh, and in fact, most of them are at Titan's North Pole. The timing uh, with launch in 2026 and arrival in 2034 means that we're getting to Titan in its northern winter. Titan has seasons very much like the Earth. The Saturnian system is tilted a little more than the Earth's, than the, the Earth's orbital axis is. And so uh, Titan has very similar seasons in that the North Pole is not illuminated during Titan's uh, northern winter and the North Pole is illuminated all the time during Titan's northern summer. Uh, but on Titan, the seasons uh, with a 29 and a half year year, the seasons are several years long. And when we arrive at Titan, the North Pole will be in winter darkness. So uh, not only does that limit exploration in situ uh, because there's not any illumination, it also means we wouldn't be able to do direct to earth communication from the surface of Titan at high northern latitudes, because if the sun isn't up, that also means that Earth's not up in the sky. So the nominal plan is to study the uh, solid materials in Titan's equatorial region, the dunes, for example, uh, the sands may be very widely sourced from across Titan. And so uh, similar to Mars Pathfinder, where the landing site was selected uh, to be able to uh, observe materials that may have come from a variety of places, we have selected the, the dunes uh, near an impact crater so that we can um, allow Titan to have brought the, you know, brought the materials to us. Um, the, uh, the big, one of the biggest questions that's outstanding after the Cassini-Huygens mission is the nature of the solid surface materials. I showed the, the map earlier. Um, there are, um, we just we don't know the compositions of these materials. We know that there are bright organic materials, there are dark organic materials, there are organic materials that also have a water ice component, um, but we really don't know what they're made of. And so the solid, you know, so we're the dragonfly uh, goal is to really understand the solid surface chemistry. Well, the follow-up part of this question is also related to the in situ environment. And it's asking about any potential weather events that you could foresee that might be dangerous or damaging, or are there just any sort of environmental active or uh, events that might happen that you'd be planning for or looking out for? Right, yeah, we absolutely, because we have weather, uh, which is fascinating to study, we also have to pay attention to what the potential implications are. So Cassini was able to observe Titan, uh, the Cassini mission actually was 13 years long. So it was almost half of a Titan year. Uh, stretching from its late uh, northern winter 
uh, into uh, just the just past the northern vernal equinox. And uh, we would be arriving at that same time as Cassini, effectively, and the, the Huygens probe descent in late uh, northern winter, late southern summer. And at this time, the major weather events, the, the clouds that we observed and, and one rainfall event, were all at the South Pole. And so we would expect that to be similar uh, in the next Titan year that when we arrive, all the, you know, the major weather activity will be at the, at the South Pole. We didn't see lower, uh, we didn't see clouds uh, or, or rainfall at lower latitudes on Titan uh, with Cassini until uh, a year or so after the uh, equinox. So the, um, uh, so it would be several years past when Dragonfly arrives that we would expect to see uh, weather events uh, um, at this latitude on Titan. But that being said, one can't always predict the weather. Um, and so we do uh, make sure that Dragonfly would be robust to rain uh, on, the, uh, on the exterior elements of Dragonfly. The winds are actually fairly calm most of the time. Again, in uh, rainfall events, there might be uh, higher winds. Uh, we would go through a pre-flight checklist the same way we, anyone does here on Earth before flying and check all the weather conditions and if it were too windy or if it, uh, you know, if the, the methane humidity indicated that it was raining, for example, we would, we would simply wave off flight for that day um, and, uh, and look to fly at another time. And I think I, I, will, I misspoke, so I'll correct myself. The Cassini mission went from northern, uh, the late northern winter until after the uh, northern summer solstice, not equinox. Well, we're just about out of time, but I've got two more questions that are specific to the systems on board. Uh, one is uh, on autonomous flight, if there are plans for autonomous activities of the rover or if or how that's being handled. And then the second is specifically on how much radioactive material will actually be uh, on board in the uh, power generation. Uh, okay, I'll take the, the first one, or I'll take the second one first. Uh, the MMRTG is the same, uh, the same power system on the Mars Curiosity and Mars Perseverance rovers. So we're using, uh, we're using a, a proven technology in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the MMRTG. The amount of heat that this uh, produces, of course, is, is sufficient to keep Dragonfly warm, but in terms of the, the broader Titan environment, uh, the external exterior of the vehicle is actually still at Titan temperatures, basically, so we're not uh, heating the environment around us uh, in that sense. Um, and then in terms, of, uh, in terms of autonomy, of course, Titan uh, being in the outer solar system with a one-way light time of over an hour uh, means that the flights will definitely need to be uh, autonomous. Um, and this is a area, another area where we really benefit from all of the work that's been done on, you know, drone technology in the last decade or so, as well as autonomous flight um, and autonomous navigation, not only for flight, uh, but for driving as well. And so we have a suite of sensors to uh, determine the, uh, you know, to, to identify safe landing sites on the, the surface of Titan. And we will tell Dragonfly where to fly, uh, and then Dragonfly will work within those parameters to uh, identify uh, safe landing sites. And as I said, we will scout those before we, um, before we select them uh, as future landing sites. So each time we should be able to scout ahead via this, this leapfrog exploration. Um, but absolutely, there is uh, autonomous uh, decision making in terms of the, the specific landing sites uh, selected within the landing zones that we, aim, that we target. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We have hit the end of our uh, time together. And so um, Dr. Elizabeth Turtle, planetary scientist from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, the principal investigator of Dragonfly, thank you so much for being part of the Ascend X Summit today. Um, for all of those viewing, thank you for joining us. We are going to move very quickly into some closing remarks from the Ascend executive producer. So please stand by and we'll get those started in just a minute.